I'm going to start with a pasuk from Zechariah, uh, which I've been thinking about a lot uh, in the classes to read this. And uh, in Zechariah 8, I'll just do it in English so that I don't have to take all the time. Um, it says, it will come to pass that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you and you shall be a blessing. And then later on at the end of this uh, chapter, it says, and many peoples and powerful nations shall come to entreat the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. So said the Lord of hosts, in those days when ten men of all the languages of the nations shall take hold of the skirt of a Jewish man, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. I don't know about you guys, but given what we're experiencing today in the world of technology, this is happening now. Um, I see a couple of friendly faces in the, in the audience. In my office, and I'm pretty sure it's true for Michael and, and many of my colleagues, we are seeing a veritable cornucopia of the nations streaming their way to this country. And it's not just, by the way, the Feast of Tabernacles where people are dancing in the streets. We're talking about investors from literally this week, I've seen Bulgarians, Chinese, Singaporeans, Colombians, Germans, uh, Koreans. I mean, I'm, I'm, and you just have no idea. And the biggest companies in the world are coming here, literally grabbing the skirt or the, the cloak of a Jew and saying, take me to your leader. Okay? They want to understand what the heck is going on here. Why is this country emerged as such a source of innovation. And I don't know how much people understand about what is going on, but just I'll, I'll share with you a data point from a week and a half ago in Forbes magazine. They were talking about how many AI startups there are in the world. AI is a very important buzzword. If you want to be buzzword compliant, you must know what AI is. Artificial intelligence, okay? You know, any company or business plan you're generating, make sure there's an AI angle, okay? That's probably the best advice I can give you tonight. Um, but in any event, it turns out that the United States leads this with 1,300 and change AI startups. Number two, of course, is China with 380 AI startups. And number three is Israel with 360. So China and Israel basically have the same amount. By the way, Germany is like eight with 100. So Israel has the same number of artificial intelligence startups as all of China, for crying out loud. We are nine million people. You can stick us in a little suburb of one of their cities. And we have four times the number as the Germans, who are 10 times our population. This is weird. This is why they are coming. It's not just for the AI, but it's for autonomous driving and precision agriculture and big data and drones and you name it, digital health, where Israel is now leading in so many areas. And they come and they ask, what is, you know, take me to your leader, but what they really ask is, what is the secret sauce? What makes you this fertile of a people? Why? And so, you know, a normal sort of gut reaction people like us is we pull out the book Startup Nation and say, read. And that's a pretty reasonable response. You can do a lot worse than that. It's a great book, by the way. Like it. Friends. You're in. I'm, I'm in it. Um, <laughs> but the book doesn't finish the story. The book talks about the special secret sauce of Israel, about the culture about the chutzpah, about the questioning authority, about the army, about the immigrant nature of the country. We all know the theses of the book. 
But what the book fails to make explicit, which I want to do tonight, is that the secret sauce is not Israel. The secret sauce is Jews, is Yiddishkeit, is Judaism, is the Jewish people. If you think that this secret sauce is simply something special about our Israeliness, you are completely mashuga. You are wrong. Because go look at the statistics about Jews and Jewish innovation and Jewish business prowess and Jewish excellence abroad. The fact that 30% of today's last 100 years Nobel Prizes in the sciences are in Jewish hands, that's normal, guys. Oh, what's our percentage of the world population? About two tenths of a percent. So this is not 10 times. This is essentially like 150 times over indicated. Any statisticians among the audience? It's off the charts. The fact that we're 150 times more indicated for Nobel Prizes, what about billionaires? You ever looked at the Forbes 400? There are two groups, by the way, who read this religiously. One are Jews, to count how many Jews. <laughs> and the other, of course, are anti-Semites, to count the Jews. <laughs> Now, if you do this counting, I'm, I'm, I'm on the Jewish side, and I do the counting, turns out that we're about 30% of the Forbes 400 billionaires in America. But it's not just America. In England, they have something called the rich list. We're about 30% there. We're about 30% in Canada. They do the same thing in Australia. They even do it in France, and we're up to 30 or 25%. What's that about? You ever done the counting on Pulitzer Prizes, or Tonys, or Oscars? So it's not Israel that's special. It's the Jewish people who are special. The Jewish people who are creative, who are risk takers, who are driven by being partners with Hashem in creation. Okay, we are just, we can't stop creating. There's a famous Chazal about why did God, there are many questions, but why God gave the Torah to the Jews. And in this Chazal, the answer initially given is Azinchen, that they are from the language of Noah's, they're daring. That's why Hashem gave us the Torah. But another uh, uh, sage responds and says, no, no, not Azinchen, Chatsufinchen. Okay? It's because we're chutzpahit. It's right there. It's the essence of who we are. If you look, as Michael, I think, did a spectacular job with, with Avraham Avinu, all of this is right in the Torah. We have no problem with money. Okay? Our, our Torah greats all were very heavy. So they were heavy with flocks. Okay? Yitzchak was the first great hydrologist. Okay, dug incredible wells. Our water technology didn't start when we came back to the land. Okay, you look at Yaakov Avinu, the first biotechnologist. What was that with those staves other than incredible biotechnology right there? Okay, but you can look at Yosef. Okay, we don't, you know, we don't have to look far for a business leader who combined it all. Okay, and this is, this is basically how we've always rolled. And to the extent that we don't tell this truth to these visitors who are coming, when Jack Ma comes this week again, he's coming now for the second time. He's back, okay, after six months, he's back again. Jack doesn't want to hear about Israel. Jack wants to hear about Yiddishkeit, okay? His, his wife was a guest at my house for Shabbos dinner. They're interested in Yiddishkeit, in what makes the Jews Jews. They get this. I mean, look, in China, for example, the Jewish stereotypes which plague much of the West, such as Jews are good with money, that's not an insult. That's a compliment. Okay? I mean, there's a story, actually, about the late President Paris, we're going to, this week, inaugurate the Paris Center, where he was brought a stack of books from China as a gift, of books about Jews that have been translated into Chinese. And he, you know, very politely went through each of these books. He got to the fifth book, and he recognized it. And he sort of said, well, uh, what's this one? He goes, oh, this is the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. 
And he like blanched. They're giving me an anti-Semitic track. And quickly someone whispered and said, they think you have a plan, it's good, move on. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line is that there's, you know, we have no problem with these, these people. They're coming here looking for our leader. And yet we have a lot to do, as Michael said, because I think many of us in the tech community really believe that there's some kind of opposition between being technology-minded and a business person and being Torah-minded and, and traditional or into the tradition. And in my opinion, there is absolutely no contradiction. In fact, that center ground where we are in this fertile middle, trying to, on the one hand, stay true to our traditions and to learn and be enriched by them, and to bring on the future, that's the challenge. And in fact, when we're talking about Asia in particular, and traditional societies, they don't want the Silicon Valley model. Silicon Valley, they hate tradition. The past is meaningless. We are totally disruptive. Forget about it. You know, we are giants now. People were Lilliputians in the past. Tell that to Chinese, you're not going to get very far. Okay, there is a common respect for tradition, for elders, filial piety. And the fact that Israel can potentially posit a different model, a model whereby we are faithful to our past, but we are building the future. That's important. But just to summarize, and I want to spend more time you know, talking and maybe answering questions if we, if we have some. There are huge questions that we need to answer, not just for ourselves, but for the world in the coming years. And we're running out of time. The technology pace is picking up so fast what are we going to do with the total wreckage of jobs? What are we going to do with all this leisure time? What are we going to do with the incredible power which is coming now, not 20, 30 years from now, but now in terms of childbirth? We are going to be able to cure incredible diseases, but we're all going to be able to choose the color of our children's eyes or what their IQ is, or their body you know, uh, uh, weight, and their mass. I mean, maybe people will be fat. But do we want this? How does the Torah feel about this? Where are the discussions happening in our people about these issues now? Because time is running out. And so I think very much as Michael said, it's not just about the fact that we are this incredibly creative and productive and wealthy kind of people who continue to attract the interests of the world. But what they want is not just our secret of how to make money or our secret of how to get a Nobel Prize, but they want to understand what is the moral underpinning, what is the answers to some of these deeper questions that we need to start addressing and addressing big time. Thank you. The, the floor in our very limited amount of time. Um, you guys both uh, immigrated to Israel, you know, out of religious faith, out of Zionism, and probably out of falling in love, as many of us do, with the kind of place and society that Israel was. Um, and then you became people who transformed it. I mean, the, the world you've created, the, the startup nation, has to a large extent shaken uh, Israeli society. We've got increased gaps between rich and poor. We've got more haves and we've got uh, have-nots. Some of the ethical questions that, um, that, that John mentioned uh, has arisen. I would love for you to, uh, to talk about you know, sort of that tension in terms of you know, the, uh, in, in, in your talk, uh, Michael, um, in, in, in trying to figure out how you help Israel not become uh, what it became in Noah's time and how it can be how it was in, in Avram's time. Um, so I came to Israel because I got inspired. I, my detail is in a book I wrote 
called Kachia uh, Sele, the Hebrew and the Vanishing Jew in, in English. Um, because I was challenged by Rabbi Yehuda Mital, he said, uh, you, you should think about moving to Israel and trying to create a factory that will employ 10,000 people who earn a decent living. I was, I was 19 at the time. And so I'm kind of animated by this notion that we have to create good and well-paying jobs so people should earn an honest and, and decent living. And I think it is um, not only unfair, um, but unreasonable to expect of any government or our government to be able to solve this problem. Governments are incapable of keeping up with the pace of change that John was, was outlining before. Um, Parenthetically, I have a less dystopian or destructive view of the jobs market than John does, but maybe that's for uh, a different time. And so I think the real challenge right now in Israel or elsewhere is what is the civic responsibility towards the other? This country grew up in a somewhat kind of mapainic um, socialist thing where you look to the government for everything. They can't help it. They may try, they're not capable of helping to raise the level of honorable employment to this country. Their recipes, in my humble opinion, are, are not only incorrect, but impractical for what we're up against. And so the challenge I often give to university students when I speak to them, but I think it's true of everyone in the room, is everyone has a personal responsibility to strap four or five people onto their shoulders and carrying them into the 21st century. Help them get educated. There's so much available online now to get educated. Help them take risks. Give them a buffer if something goes wrong. Tell them if you failed, it's really okay. I got your back. That's a civic responsibility, and it cannot be taken on by the government, and we should not expect them to do it. They just can't. I think the biggest challenge we're facing now uh, in this sort of the economic sense, is that we're running out of people, okay? Uh, we have, to, Michael describes it, feed the beast, okay? That we are, we are so short manpower, and particularly women power, um, that we need to bring in groups who are simply underrepresented in the high-tech success story. And the three big groups are women, okay, who are woefully, at that picture with Angela Merkel, should just blow all of our minds. It really, I, I, I was disgusted, okay? Um, if you haven't seen it, there's a picture of the Israeli tech industry meeting with Chairwoman uh, or President Merkel, and they're all men, okay? They're like 30 men, and Merkel, wrong. Number two, of course, are Arabs, okay? Uh, we need to get them in a different level engaged with our companies. We're doing good work at the Technion, now 22% of the Technion is Arab students, and that's great, but we need to you know, get them employed. And the third, of course, is Haridin, okay? And work is being done, we got a lot more to do. But we also have to do something else, and this is gonna be harder for us. We have to open up the country to the best and the brightest the world has to offer, whether they are Jews or not, and bring them here now. It is absurd that we have Thai farm workers and Romanian construction workers and Filipino caregivers, God bless them, I love them all, and not Indian programmers or Chinese hardware designers. It is wrong. And we now need 50,000, 100,000. We are strong enough to take this and to do this. If we don't, we're not going to sustain ourselves. And finally, I think that the next future for the investment scene and for the entrepreneurs is going to be what's called impact investing. Meaning the idea that you are an entrepreneur or an investor who wants to make money and do good at the same time. And there's no contradiction, right? You can actually make huge profits by creating an exoskeleton that lets people walk and yet help disabled people. By saving water with irrigation equipment, and feeding the world, you make money. By helping people stay safe online or protecting against financial fraud, that is good. And we have to understand that with the change, I, you know, I'm sort of an unreconstructed capitalist, and I know that that's not always a popular thing to say, 
I, I really believe that you can create jobs, you can create wealth, you can create a much bigger pie, not what Malthus was talking about, okay? And we can do good at the same time, okay? There's too many of us who think that capitalism is somehow wrong, who have nostalgia for the good old days of socialism. That really worked well, okay? We can all be poor together, okay? That's not a smart thing. And I think Jewishly, it doesn't make sense either. Okay. Um, Nadia, do we have time for a couple of questions? No? No? Come on. I'm, I'm, it's the uh, mood. We have to have one, at least. Okay. Um, do you want a mic or? I'll take one. Um, so I got to hear both of you many times, and both speeches were very inspiring now. Poor guy. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you guys keep on coming to Tel Aviv. It's, um, my question is, it's to both of you because you're both uh, Shomer Shabbos Jews and God-believing Jews and both of you uh, have a lot of chokhmah and learn a lot and something that you spoke about Michael struck me is that in times of abundance many times we leave God it's easier to leave him we forget and the question is really because both of you said the same thing what people are looking for and our koch is from our faith it's from our righteousness it's from our learning it's from our Yiddishkeit as both of you defined it and the question is how do we hold on to that how do we give an answer to the younger generation or how we give an answer to all the technological questions that are coming up where the rabbis, as one, are not keeping up with the answers and they don't really have the answers because this is a different time and the technology is moving faster and the abundance really makes us walk away because it's easier. I don't have time for it. Quick, quick answer. Look, I think it's about creating a space in your own private life, in your own companies, in your own environments, which are a dogma. So I know in our company, we have a regular minion. We have a bunch of people who are ex near learners sitting with people with earrings. Okay, in other words, we have a completely mixed environment. We start every month, we have a Rosh Kodesh luncheon, that's when we get together as a company. Dafka, we chose to do it on Rosh Kodesh. And we start, every time we start the company meeting, we start with the Devar Torah. And if someone doesn't like it, they can leave. Okay, sorry. You know, it's not religious coercion, it's just natural. In our company, Holomoed is off. Okay, we, we're shut down. Sorry, we close on these holidays. We're not open, okay, on Tisha B'Av. People are off to do what they want to do. And by doing that, and by essentially having people who are showing their Shabbat and showing that they can work like dogs six days a week and take a day off, it's, 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 it's an example. And people who are not religious or not yet religious are watching this, and the non-Jews are watching this. And I think that's extremely important. Um, I'll, I'll take a different tack just to, 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 to fill in the picture up. I think what you describe as kind of lack of rabbinic leadership, and John was talking about it at the end of his talk also, you know, do we have answers to a lot of these questions? It's a real issue. Um, we're, we're teaching rabbis today, excuse me, like they taught them 400 years ago, and the world has moved on. And it's, it's a real challenge. I've given uh, many talks to convocations of, of, of rabbis, and we're not having the same conversation. And, they're not current on technology, and they're even less current on the philosophical issues uh, brought about by technology. And it's, it's, it's an incredible challenge, and I think one that's not going to be solved anytime soon. So John's point, I think, is, is, is right on spot, but from a different perspective. And I go back to the civic responsibility I talked about before, which is stepping into this breach must be uh, an openness of people to listen to people who don't have the title rabbi in front of them. You can also listen to rabbis. Um, no offense. Um, but, and, 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 and to really welcome people in. We are a welcoming people. Irrespective of your exact beliefs, or where you stand, in religious terms, etc., we must and need to be a welcoming people. And when you're a welcoming people, I think that reflects well on what God wants from this world and what God wants from us. We accept people, we take them in, we hug them and we don't exclude them. And that's a very powerful message because these challenges of technology, 
these challenges of philosophy are going to be sorted out in these kinds of conversations and through a lot of welcoming love and ethics and not a lot of top-down hierarchy. We are being welcomed to end the session. I apologize. <laughs> Hopefully uh, somebody who has a burning question can come up and, and approach you uh, after the session. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the session.